So, on the uh, the topic of Tikkiyat uh, Hashofar, there's a very interesting uh, intersection of uh, of Halakha and Hashkafa, uh, in the sense that everybody knows that we need to build a Shofar on Rosh Hashanah. What not everybody knows is uh, how many times or why, or for that matter, how the Shofar is blown or what it's supposed to sound like. Uh, these sound like silly uh, elementary, rudimentary uh, questions. The reality is it's not this way. Uh, first of all, and here we're going to have to mix a little bit between the first part of the shiur and the second part of the shiur, uh, the Torah tells us that we have to blow the shofar. What's the word actually used by the Torah? Spoke about this a little bit last week. So we say litzkoa b'shofar, tichiyata shofar, even though that word is typically used, first of all, it relates maybe more to uh, the, horn, the trumpets. Uh, but the Torah itself refers to Rosh Hashanah by what name? It's certainly not called Rosh Hashanah. Yom Hazikaron? Uh, so, it's Yom good. and Zikaron, not together, but they both come along with another uh, title. How do we refer to Rosh Hashanah in the Musaf? Or Yom is not. Yom? Something to Shofar, right? Something. So, uh, the Torah refers to it as Yom. What's <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's funny because it's a high holidays. You think everybody, yeah. So, we do refer to it as Yom Azikaron Haze in the Alevi. So, I thought that. The Torah doesn't call it Yom Azikaron. The Torah calls it two things. It calls it on two occasions Yom Tirwa. And then on one occasion it calls it. It's a tricky question. Zikron Tirwa. So the Gemara says, so how do you get Yom Teruah, Zichron Teruah? How do you, uh, so Yom Teruah means a day of, I don't know what Teruah means yet, so I'm not going to pretend, but a day of Teruah, it's called twice. The third, the third time it's referred to as Zichron Teruah. Zichron Teruah means uh, a memory, a remembrance of uh, Teruah. So the Gemara says, easy. This is uh, an easy proof to the fact that uh, Hachamim forbade the Shofar blowing on Shabbat. So when Rosh Hashanah comes out on a weekday, we blow the shofar, it becomes Yom Teruah. When it doesn't, it becomes a Zichron Teruah. We just uh, remind ourselves of the fact that normally, generally, under ordinary circumstances, we should be blowing the shofar today. We're not going to because we might potentially, Chazal forbade it, because we might come to violate the Shabbat uh, by carrying a shofar where there is none, or carrying it where there's no Eruv, etc. So Teruah means what in Hebrew? It appears very often uh, not super frequently in the uh, Torah. Sefer Tehillim is full of it. Hari uh, Hashem. So Hari Hashem means, you know, give Teruah to, uh, to God. Um, Teruah as a concept, maybe not as much, but Haru B'Tzil Tzalei Shema. Haru B'Tzil Tzalei. Teruah. Teruah. Second to last pasuk in all of Sefer Tehillim. So the concept appears very often. Uh, apparently it has to do with sound. Teruah apparently implies some kind of sound. If this is what I do to a trumpet, and the trumpet, you know, then produces a sound, so I'm, I'm sounding the trumpet. I'm making a, uh, uh, I'm making it sound off when I do this. So the discussion of what exactly is teruah, believe it or not, is a machlok. One thing is clear: that tekiah means one long uninterrupted sound. This, thank God, at least uh, there's no machlok about. Would have made life very difficult. Teruah leads us to a machloket in the, uh, the Gemara. Why machloket? Talk about that in a little bit. It's not like we haven't been blowing the shofar every Rosh Hashanah since we've received the Torah. Uh, it's just that there are different uh, traditions and we'll, we'll explain or attempt to explain how that came about. One opinion holds that Teruah is what we call today Teruah. Not to be mistaken with what the Torah says because we don't know necessarily what the Torah refers to by Teruah. When we're told we have to uh, uh, sound off a Teruah, what we write today in the Mahzorim, where it gives you those uh, maps, you know, the grid of uh, what uh, Tekiyah we're blowing, we say Tekiyah, Teruah, Tekiyah. So Tekiyah is a long, uninterrupted sound. The Teruah in the middle is the staccato uh, sound. Like this. According to Rashi, it's like at least nine sounds, basically. So this is one opinion. There's a Mishnah that tells us every sound is supposed to be preceded and succeeded by uh, Tekiyah. We'll talk about that in a bit, too. So, one opinion holds that teruah is this broken sound. 
Another opinion holds, no. Teruah is what we actually call today Shivarim. The concept of Shivarim does not appear in the Torah. It's not mentioned anywhere. It's uh, one of the opinions in the Gemara as to how we fulfill the obligation of Teruah. So what's Shivarim? It's not shattered sounds, it's just broken one. Lishbor in Hebrew, Shaber means to break. So Shivarim would be tu, 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 three medium uh, Three sounds that are medium in their duration, not especially long, not especially short. Rashi actually makes a uh, calculation where the tikya should last a certain number of breaths. The shivarim should be approximately three portions of that, in other words, that broken into thirds, and the teruah should be shivarim broken into thirds. It's kind of uh, geometric. So we have an opinion that holds teruah is this uh, staccato uh, broken up sound, the, the shattered sound, so to speak. Another opinion that holds that it's shivarim. One, two, three. Third opinion, naturally, this is typically Jewish. Why don't we do both at the same time? In other words, how do we fulfill the obligation? By doing Shivarim and Teruah together, we fulfill the obligation, we relieve any doubt. Maybe it's like this, maybe it's like that. Maybe doing this separately and that separately doesn't cut it. Maybe we actually need to do both. So what we end up with is sets of sounds that are Tikiyah, Shivarim, Tikiyah, Tikiyah, Teruah, Tikiyah, and then all of this why? Well, the Torah tells us to build a shofar and we seem to have, it looks anyway like we have an unclear tradition as to how precisely this is done, which is baffling by the way. Absolutely baffling. Over the course of 2,000 years, you would think 3,000 years, but 2,000 since the destruction of the Miklash, why should this have changed? Why should this have moved, gone anywhere from what was traditionally done. You would think it's impressive enough that you hear it once, you can't remember how it's done. So, competing traditions uh, arose. Sometimes a tradition arises out of uh, a lack of clarity or a lack of knowledge in our part. Easiest example of this would be something along the lines of species of kosher, kosher birds, kosher fish, kosher animals, where as long as we uh, can identify a species either by its biblical name, or we can identify communities that observe the Bible and that traditionally consumed or didn't consume certain animals, at least we can resolve some of the doubt. Because how do I know the chickens from today are the chickens that we always had? Well, if these chickens have been consumed uh, in communities that haven't really gone very far and didn't lose their tradition over the course of time, we can rely on them and say, oh, this is testimony, apparently this is how it was done back in the day. How do you lose a tradition on something like the order of the of the paragraphs, the Parashiot and the Tefillin? This is Rabbeinu Tam, by the way, who is Rashi's grandson, and who says, no, what my grandfather said, not necessarily true. We should replace the third with the fourth and switch the order of the last two uh, Parashiot. So, there is such a thing as a tradition changing or a tradition being uh, uh, bent a little bit in order to accommodate for competing traditions. We say like this, you say like that. Uh, we're going to try to be careful to fulfill more than one obligation or to, to fulfill the obligation according to more than one uh, opinion. Classic example of this would be shiurim. All that has to do with everything quantifiable. So how big is a tefah or how big is an ama? So a tefah is supposed to be the, uh, the breadth of your hand minus the thumb. The hands are going to be a little bit bigger, but three or four inches approximately. Um, and this is about uh, 8 to 10 uh, centimeters. And the ama is supposed to be the distance between the elbow and the end of your longest finger, generally the, uh, the one in the middle. So that's great if everybody measures for themselves, but if we want to standardize things, how do we know what the traditional tefah was or the traditional ama? Just because people got bigger doesn't mean we have to build necessarily bigger mikvaot, doesn't necessarily mean we have to bring uh, bigger lulavot, a bigger atrogim, uh, Whatever has to do with uh, weights and measures should, uh, in theory, be the same as it was back in, uh, in the time of uh, Hazar. So, simple enough, you have uh, a classic uh, machloket between uh, the Chazonish and Rav Chaim Le'eh. This goes back to the 20th century, early 20th century. And the easiest thing for me to do is to say, To, there's an opinion that says, uh, and my Hadassim are kosher if they're 9 inches long. There's an opinion that says it has to be closer to 12. What do I lose by holding by the 12? This way it's kosher according to both opinions. This is classic. This approach has caught on like wildfire everywhere in Torah where you try to say, no, there's more than one opinion. 
Why stick your head into a machloket? Why put yourself in a compromising position when you can just fulfill all the obligations and you know do things the uh, the easiest possible way, the route of least, the path of least resistance? Just go with what's not disputed or what fulfills both opinions. So, so, so this is an example of this, and it goes back pretty far. Yeah. If I may, with uh, all due respect, it's easier for the rabbi to uh, to decide, but it makes like way way harder for pretty much everybody, including the rabbi in a way. But well, so here's the catch. You don't take any risk. You don't have a... There is, there is no such thing, and this is an important, uh, both a halachic and a hashkafic concept, there is no such thing as a humrah, as a stricture, as attempting to be strict without it costing you something, right? In fact, in Chazal's golden words, it's, a, it's always going to be a humrah habali de kula. Wherever you're strict about something, you're inevitably, inescapably lenient about something else. I'm super strict about the meat that I eat, which means I must, by definition, be spending more money on it. And maybe that's money that could have potentially gone to uh, help uh, pay for mitzvot. Maybe I could have used that money to give tzedakah to a widow or to a convert. Guess what? Or even a, a run-of-the-mill poor Jew. That's a biblical commandment. That's a mitzvah midoraita. Who said the Torah requires you or expects you to eat uh, meat with a thousand labels on it or buy that dish to have a milk that what still exists? The milk was called uh, Mahmirim. The name of the milk, they weren't even hiding it. It wasn't like, but that's so-and-so. By the way, small letters, we happen to be very strict. It was called Mahmirim. It was like the name of the product is we are strict. And how strict were they? They had four different hashgachot on the product. Well, if you want your milk to cost you five, ten dollars a glass, feel free to pay whatever you'd like to. But the question is, what, at, at what expense does this come? Many people who are becoming, uh, you know, recently observant, the, uh, the, the born-again types, uh, run after these things blindly because they believe it's a measure of their uh, fear of God, their love of God, their adherence to the mitzvot. The reality is, it just might mean that you're putting all of your priorities, you're putting all of your emphasis on things that are tangible. Here is a gem, a beautiful gem from uh, Rav David Feinstein. He once said that all of the homerot of our generation, all of these, like, Johnny come lately customs to just be strict for everything. He said, you'll find that 999 out of 1,000 are quantifiable. What people perceive as being strict means my talit is of a certain size, my tefillin are of a certain size, um, my, my uh, kiddush cup is of a certain volume, uh, I'm careful to only eat in certain weights to make sure that there's no safek about the bracha. Very often we are strict where things are quantifiable, and, and therefore it's easy for me to say, haha, my love, is more kosher than yours. Why? Because it's, if it's kashrut, is measured in length, then mine is longer than yours. My etrog is uh, rounder than yours, etc. It's easy for me to say, to point at, and compare and contrast. You don't find very many humrot in things like tzniot or lashon hara because it's not stylish. Like, it didn't make it into the, the vogue. Uh, I, I can't really show off how careful I am with tzniot or, uh, or lashon hara because they're not really quantifiable. So... <laughs> There's a sect like this. Did you hear this? Yeah. There was a story out. in Israel. They've been kicked out. They're running by the Mali, you heard? And, and the, the, in the Jewish community? Like, or in the, yeah. yeah, they're like wearing like hijab type of... So there was a, there was a situation... Yeah. While, was a story I, was, like that while I was in Israel, in Yerushalayim, there was a story of this woman dressed in a hijab who's walking uh, towards the Kotel. So there's a border guard officer who shouts to her, Stop. You have to pass the security check like everyone else. She ignores him. He calls a second time. He calls a third time. And he said, stop or I'll shoot. She ignored him. He took out a rifle and he shot her in the leg. And it turned out this woman was Jewish. Right? Like she could have been an Arab carrying a bomb that do this five times a day to catch women like this. So, you know, as the situation uh, began to uh, be clarified, she belongs to one of these uh, psychopathic sects where not only do women wear whatever seven layers of clothing at all times, they're not allowed to talk to men. Now, I get the generally, like, don't flirt, I don't go to bars kind of talking to guys. <laughs> I don't get the, I don't respond to a security guard with a rifle. <laughs> uh, I don't know what country you're from or what, you know, that's mentality you got. That's, that's obscene. It's absolutely obscene. They have machrokot about this all over Europe, by the way, if it's okay for women to wear the hijab, because if they're getting pictures taken for their passports and driver's license, they need to be able to identify them. So the purpose is that she should be unidentifiable. I, I guess there are terrorist groups that enjoy that, but 
if for the purpose of security, she needs to be visible. Well, she could have stopped. She didn't speak to him. Yeah, I don't know anyway. what she was trying to uh, achieve. She has also a broken people, leg now. I don't know how that helps. But, <laughs> yeah. Also, people can, like... Maybe she can't run that fast towards men that she'll see in the future. Like, in universities, they were, like, it was in this... I think it was in one of the newspapers, like, like one can take a test for the other, like, and you would never know. Yeah, you'd have no idea. You'd have some... This is true. So, so this is an example of like a, of a humra, of a stricter that's gone way out of control, and it, clearly it comes at the expense of something. Here, I don't even know why he didn't shoot to kill. Not that I'm suggesting he should kill her, um, but but if someone runs through a security checkpoint, refuses to be checked or to stop, uh, I would have aimed higher than the leg. So, so bottom line, if the if this uh, approach of uh, not cutting clear alaha and uh, you know, just making humrah and things like that is uh, can be so nefast and dangerous to uh, to our practice. How come Chazal already started to adopt it with the shofar, for example? So this is the question. Where does a person uh, pick and choose his or her humrah? Well, you need to know a lot in order to know uh, where to be mahmir and where to be mahmir. In other words, this is not a decision for your typical lay person to make. Left to my own devices, I would decide to be strict about a whole bunch of things and be lenient about a whole bunch of things. You need to know. First of all, what's midoraita, what's midorabanan? So, Hazal, you'll find always, without fail, if they were strict about something, it's because it's it's a biblical commandment or it's potentially biblical. Yom Tov Shini Shil They didn't want people violating Yom Tov, so they, you know, made two in order to make sure that we didn't miss uh, the one that we're supposed to observe. It sounds funny, but they only did that to protect people from violating Yom Tov. Uh, if they were extra careful about certain things, it's always because there was some biblical commandment in the background. Or the potential to mix it up with something potentially biblical. Uh, you'll find the Sephardim really continued that tradition. They are strict where things are biblical, they are lenient where things are rabbinic. That's the way it's supposed to be. It's the way it was in the Gemara. Other communities have other traditions, but this is the way Sephardim typically hold. The question is, what's the situation? Is this a situation in which we, we blanked, we just don't know, which tradition is the right one, and therefore that, that seems to be the clear, the reading from the Gemara is like this. I don't know what Teruah is. Is it supposed to be totally broken up, or is it these, uh, you know, medium <coughs> with, uh, uh sounds? Therefore, I'm going to do A and B, and A and B together. So, this way I cover my, uh, my bases. The Torah doesn't require me to hear all these sounds, but at least this way I know for sure I definitely got it. I nailed it. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how did these different traditions develop? So, there are situations in which we literally just don't know. We don't have, for example, a clear-cut response to what day does Ben Hashem HaShot belong. This is a classic biblical situation. I don't know if when the sun sets on Friday, is that the beginning of Shabbat? Is it the end of Friday and the beginning of Shabbat? Or is the, the stars coming out, starlight, the actual end of Friday, beginning of Shabbat? So we have a safik. We have a genuine safik. We are aware, well aware of both times. They appear all, all over the place in the Mishnah and the Gemara. It's just not, our tradition is such that we don't have a clear, precise explanation. In Israel, it's about 13 and a half minutes that are loaded up in the air. So wherever something is biblical, we start before the sunset and we end after the stars come out. That's how we do Shabbat today. It's about 25 hours. Uh, we don't take chance of Yom Kippur or with the Yom Tov. And if that makes my secular week a little bit shorter, so be it. There's no mitzvah to work during the secular week as there is to observe the Shabbat and not to violate it. So there are things that we have. It's, it's just a question. It's not like you have communities that will tell you Ben uh, Hashem is definitely Friday or definitely Shabbat. We just conduct ourselves with, uh, with the whole issue as if it's a complete and total doubt. When it comes to the Torah itself, here is a fascinating uh, perspective on this. The Geonim wrote that the Torah told us Yom Teruah. Okay? There are situations in the Torah where something is not necessarily well defined and there are reasons for it. Okay? The classic Mishnah that we refer to in a discussion like this, Elu Dvarim, the first Mishnah of Masechet Pe'ah. Elu Dvarim She'en Lam Shi'or. Ha'pe'ah Bikurim Warayah Udrut Hazadim Tamu Torah. These are things that have no Shi'or. What's a Shi'or in Hebrew? No quantity. Uh, no a, a portion or a quota or yeah, I mean uh, a requisite uh, measure. So, thank you. So these things have no shiur. The pe'ah. What's the pe'ah? The, the, the corners of 
Well, the peah doesn't mean a corner in Hebrew, it means an edge, but it means some point of the circumference of your field should be left uh, unharvested for the poor. How much do I need to leave? Is it, there's no... Practically sure. nothing. I can leave like one stalk of wheat. And I fulfilled my biblical obligation of having a, a peah accessible to anyone who, uh, any poor indigent individual who wants to come. I didn't violate the Torah concept as long as I did something, anything. Give me the same thing. I give tzedakah. How much do I have to give? I can give a few cents, and I fulfilled my biblical obligation, my, my yearly quota for tzedakah. Clearly, we shoot higher than this, but the Torah only tells you to do it. It doesn't tell you how much to do. And in the event that it doesn't tell you how much to do, the assumption is, biblically, you fulfill your obligation with just about nothing. Any minimal quantity would do. You want to give more than this? It certainly seems like the Torah encourages it. No one's going to discourage you from leaving more food for the poor or giving more tzedakah. But you can't accuse me of violating my biblical obligation if I gave very little. For whatever reason it may be, it's my attitude, it's my approach, I can't afford it, I think I can't afford it, etc. So, the Gionim write like this. Really, any sound you make on Rosh Hashanah that sounds like crying, there's a whole limud why the shofar blowing should sound like crying, any sound that you make would fulfill the obligation. The Gemara says, whole discussion that it has, why it's compared to Sisra and his mother, uh, but we refer to uh, uh, Yilala or Yevava, we refer to crying. So how does crying sound? I guess it depends on the person doing the crying. Uh, there are people who cry slowly, sobbing, you would call this in English, or weeping, you know, you're crying, you take a breath every so often. And there are people who cry hysterically, and it comes out kind of uh, staccato. So, what's the, uh, the the right way to cry? What's the most genuine, authentic, halakhically viable cry? There is no mandated way to cry. That's the shofar. It's supposed to remind us to do teshuvah. It's supposed to remind us cry, desperation, think akedat yitzchak, think you're being judged. This could be you on the mizbeach. So, you would cry, and your crying would be spontaneous. I would cry like this. You would cry like that. I mean, we both would have. Fulfill the obligation. So the Gedim say, really, uh, left to their own devices, every Jew would be blowing uh, the shofar the way he or she felt crying is supposed to, uh, to happen. It happened to come to a point where they didn't want too many competing traditions to come out. People would start confusing things all together, either not counting the, the sounds they're supposed to be making, or uh, making sounds that weren't necessarily going to be valid. And so they made an effort at that particular point in history to consolidate the, uh, the customs, to unify the customs, and to say, okay, the three major competing uh, traditions that we have are Teruah, Shavarim, and there are those who already have tried to do both of them in order to, uh, to fulfill the two uh, larger overarching categories of crying. If this is how people cry in general, or the two most uh, easily identifiable methods of, of crying, then they said, okay, we're afraid now with the Galut, with the diaspora, that people are going to confuse traditions, they're going to start making up, uh, improvising even more and more sounds, some of which are going to get out of control. In other words, it's not that we lost the tradition on how to blow the Shofar, or for that matter that we forgot what it sounds like when people cry, we've done plenty of crying. It's that the tradition had sort of bifurcated, uh, both communities fulfilled their obligations, everybody was, uh, was well within their rights to do the way they had grown up and the way they had heard. And the Gemara, as it often does, kind of uh, unified things and made them uniform and, uh, and therefore at least preserved them from being lost. Uh, I don't know that this came at a very great cost, which is probably why they did it. I mean, in theory we lost out on some potentially interesting improvised crying like shofar blowing sounds, but at the end of the day, if this is how they saw fit to preserve the tradition at this particular time, they said, look, we have to, you know, limit this and, uh, and, and not allow the tradition to get completely and totally out of control. At least we'll stop here where we have these two. And so as not to offend one community over the other, or one opinion over the other, they incorporated both of them. So the Gilding right. It could have been that they said, look, tefillah is long enough as it is. Uh, it was clearly a lot shorter then than it is today. Uh, therefore, we're going to bring the axe down on one uh, method or the other of blowing the shofar. And they said, no, easy enough to be and accommodate the two. We can make peace. We can continue to perpetuate both traditions. We just don't want it to get completely, totally uh, out of control. A peek behind the scenes here would, uh, 
yields something very interesting. We have such a tradition. There's a discussion, by the way, about whether or not we should be uh, confessing on Rosh Hashanah. The reality is you don't find it anywhere. You don't see any such thing as a confession recited out loud on Rosh Hashanah. Yom Kippur is full of it. We do practically nothing but confess. On Rosh Hashanah itself, we don't do any of it. The only place you'll find even an allusion to it is uh, during the shofar blowing, where usually, even if it is printed in the mahzor, it's printed in small letters, or it's grayed out, or it's in parentheses, where they'll tell you it's good, it's nice, it's proper, it's appropriate, etc. It's fitting to repent uh, during the blowing of the shofar, or to listen to the shofar sound, and to allow it to kind of penetrate your soul and really motivate you, inspire you to do better. So the shofar is crying, but really I should be crying. I should be the one you know, breaking down and saying, I want to change my life, I want to be a better person, I want to maximize my potential, I want to stop wasting my time here. So this particular uh, uh, confession, there's no standard form for it, obviously. Everybody confesses what they, in theory, have done wrong or might have done wrong. Uh, interestingly enough, the Arizal writes and he says, that while the shofar is blowing, it's very important to accept upon yourself to do teshuva, to look inside yourself and really try to repent for anything you might have done wrong. And he says, this should be a very personal process, and any avirah that you know deep down inside that you spend too much time doing, or that you're not careful enough about avoiding, you should focus on. So instead of me going through a whole litany of things that other people might have done, I'm not a politician, Baruch Hashem, I try not to commit adultery. Maybe this is not the Avera that I should be focusing on during this particular moment. There will be plenty of other times for it. But maybe, I mean, I, I, as a nation, on a whole, in general, we, we request forgiveness for everything everybody's done wrong. In this particular video, this particular parenthetical confession, uh, the Arizal says, you know, this is a personal thing. People really need to appreciate this. So it's funny, the way it works, how we have the Mahzor, and because maybe we're not so fluent in, uh, in Hebrew or in Aramaic, uh, we, we almost limit our confessions to what's actually written, to what's printed in the books. The reality is there's nothing more personal than a confession. There's nothing more personal. We don't involve priests in our confession, just for the record. Uh, and there's a reason for that. It's possible, sure, even advisable, if there's certain things you want to work on, find a, uh, a rav, find a rabbanit, someone that you can confide in. And, you know, there are definitely uh, good pieces of advice and, uh, and good tips that you can, uh, you can always learn and follow. There's a methodology to the Yitzhak Hara. It's not just... Uh, read more Torah, go to more Shiva, it'll be okay. But the, the, the ad-lib aspect of tefillah, unfortunately, got a little bit lost when tefillah was standardized. So now we have the Amidah. The Amidah is the formula. You want to pray, we consider prayer to be, you fulfilled your obligation if you prayed according to the formula that's already been written. It's not meant to completely mute the sound of personal prayer. It's not meant to prevent us from trying to uh, reach out to Hashem in a more personal way. Although I uh, don't profess to be a uh, breast lover chassid and I will not be going to Uman for Rosh Hashanah. Uh, <laughs> I have never and probably never will. Uh, nonetheless, you should know that breast lovers are actually pretty good about this. They really do um, ring the bell of, uh, of individual tefillah. They will recommend, they will suggest that wherever you have the chance uh, you reach out in your own words, in your own way. Uh, you request what you personally believe that you need. You, you apologize what you personally believe you need to apologize for. Um, that you make the connection with Hashem is something personal. And Rav Nachman probably wouldn't have said it had he not noticed in his generation that this was getting lost. People were, were really, you know, there's a sidur. Someone decided for me how I should pray. Very little room for me to express myself personally. And, and that runs the risk of, well, if I connect to it, great. If I don't, I don't. Yeah, there's a lot uh, in Barsa that talks about uh, the, the individual consciousness, like the individual awareness, the individual uh, focus. Uh, in a way, Barsa is like 180 degrees diametrically opposed to Chabad, where Chabad is super community oriented, <coughs> super reach out, follow, connect, network, bridge, you know, just bring more and more people together. Uh, Chabad would never recommend that you go out on your own and do your own thing. That's not their, their approach. So, philosophically speaking, they're two very, very different schools. 
uh, Chabad, the process of Teshuvah, is acknowledging that you're part of a community, that people need your help, and up until now you haven't given enough of it, do more. So we raise, uh, you know, they raise the kids to be uh, shlichim from one year old, and they train their rabbis at a young age. It's a relatively short uh, course, just go out and start communities and reach out to people. And the reality is there aren't enough people who reach out to people. And Breslev has a very, very different approach there. It's more about figure yourself out, get your, your bearings about you, focus on what you personally uh, have by way of strengths and weaknesses, thank Hashem for your strengths, use them to your advantage, and, and work on your disadvantages and your, your weaknesses uh, personally, but all through a very personalized, uh, maybe less structured relationship with, uh, with Hashem. Less formal, anyway, if, if you will. So, uh, here I happen to be uh, tolling the, the Breslov bell only because I think it really, uh, it catches this aspect. And, and, and there's clearly room for this. We're not experts, we're not prophets, we're, we don't compose the fields for other people to follow, but there's something to be said. If at nothing, at no other point in life, at least during this personal you do in Rosh Hashanah, no one knows better than you what you've done and what you haven't done, for better and for worse. No one knows better than you what struggles and challenges you have, and the shofar is really a, a cry of desperation. It's supposed to sound like crying. These competing traditions are competing traditions on who cries better, who cries louder, whose cry uh, inspires more crying, so to speak. Uh, contagious kind of crying. And, and this is really uh, where Teshuvah begins. There's plenty of time to confess in public and in Kippur. Rosh Hashanah, when you're being judged, it's, it's you're judged on an individual basis. Right? I forget the Gemara says that we all pass before Hashem like lambs, where you might have a giant flock, but they still go through one by one. Each person, each nation, each family, everybody has a judgment coming to them on a personal level and then on a greater kind of national level. So uh, it's interesting how, unfortunately, we sacrificed a little bit of this individual, uh, customizable aspect of our relationship with, uh, with Hashem, perhaps for the purpose of the greater good, that at least we have something uniform and consistent that we can call Judaism. You go from one business to the next to kind of know what you're getting into. Um, what you can expect, but uh, there's definitely a value, nonetheless, to the, uh, the personal, individual uh, component of it. So, let's take a quick uh, couple of minutes, and then we'll uh, continue with uh, some more